is an ulnar gutter. Um, one of the things we want to remember to do for this is put a little padding between the fingers that are going to be stuck together. You can use a short piece of web roll or you could just use some 2 by 2s or some 4 by 4s if you have them um, just to kind of help absorb all the sweat that they're going to do. This time I sometimes ask the people if they can to either bend their hand this way and then I can easily wrap or if they're really coordinated to bend their hand this way then I can easily wrap. Um, <laughs> sometimes you just kind of got a forcer thing around. We are, uh, our way around. Um, again, at the end we want to have three or four layers because that's where the pressure point at the end of the splint is. Okay. And then over the bony prominence where the bony prominence is or where the injury is are other areas where you want to have three to four layers of wrapping. Um, other than that you really only want about two layers of wrapping. Too much um, wrapping can actually also cause a problem because you can imagine if I just let this big bulk of material here that would actually create a pressure point. So you don't want to put too much wrapping on but three to four layers over bony prominences and roughly two layers um, over the rest of the uh, extremity to be wrapped. This one we're also going to go basically three quarters of the way up the forearm and then we're going to end with a few extra wraps at the top, tearing off and just smoothing down and just kind of checking that as you're going to put your hand in this position of function where you're going to bend the wrist back um, and then you're going to bend the metacarpal joints somewhere between 50 and 90 degrees and the um, proximal phalangeal joint at 20 degrees. Some authors actually say to keep it straight. You just want to make sure that you don't have huge bumps in your wrap when you do that. So again, upper extremity, we're going to have 10 layers of wrap. You can actually put this mold, you can try to measure this way, it's easier just to do it straight. Um, again, going out from the tips of the fingers, measuring back, and again, this material is usually pretty easy to tear, but if you do have problems, you can go ahead and use a pair of scissors. Same thing, I like to use hot water, but some people will tell you to use room temperature water, dip it, get it fully wet, and then I use my fingers just to mold the strips together and to get the extra water out. You don't want to squeeze every bit of water out because you want some water in there to let the plaster stay malleable. Um, and if you squeeze too much, you actually get a lot of the plaster to come off, so you don't want that either. If you're working by yourself and you're stuck and you're trying to put this on and then get it to hold, one of the things you can actually do is actually lay your patient flat and have them bend their arm this way so that when you apply the plaster it'll actually gravity stay on or you can just have your patient act as an assistant or you can grab a tech and have them do it. Okay, just hold that one end for me. Same thing then we're going to use some web roll to secure always wrapping from proximal to distal. I just said that Don't totally backwards. <laughs> always wrapping from distal to proximal. You can let go. Always good to have a mistake or two in the video. It makes it seem real. Okay, again molding our edges so that they don't seem that they're going to cut anywhere. Okay. So for splints that you have to mold, you may want to use a not hot, hot water because it gives you a little bit more mold time. For splints that you don't really need to do much molding on, um, you can use hotter water as it will set a little bit faster. Okay. Actually, if you can bend them in, can you do it that way? Sometimes that's easier. Sometimes, the, sometimes they can't do it, and you can really just kind of work around by pulling a little bit and then tucking it in. And again, we're going to lock first. And then again, not pulling too tight and covering about 50% with each additional wrap. 
Sometimes one will be enough, sometimes you'll need an additional one. Okay. Now, there's lots of different ways now to get this into the functional position. Sometimes you can ask the patient just to do it, but it's hard with the plaster on there. What I like to do is just take the hand and bend it back. Um, if you're good at this, you can actually take the fingers and lock them. Basically what I'm doing is I lock them by a little downward pressure, and then you can actually just use backwards force, and it will actually put them in that position of function. All right, but sometimes you need to use your palms to do it. Okay. So once you sort of get it there, again, being careful not to use your fingers too much to squeeze, you can actually take the fingers and lock them in extension and then just, you can see I can just actually push back and I can actually get it to go into the position that I want. Again, being careful not to use your fingers and making indents anywhere though. And that will take about five minutes, so you may have to use some gentle pressure to keep it there. Once you get it set, you don't have to use a lot of cranking. It can actually just use a little backwards pressure. And you can see in general, it'll stay in that position of function. And if you're having problems, you can always use your palms to do a little molding and use some backward pressure this way. You have to remember the cooler the water used, the longer it takes to set. So in something like this that you have to mold, you may have to sit in the room and hold it in that position for a while. Because if I let go, Jamie can very easily straighten things out at this point. And once things start to harden, um, the fracture actually is very um, fragile and it will crack if it's not held until it's completely hardened in place. Good enough.